Good morning. I'm in my car in the laundromat parking lot, so hey, why not do a video? Uh, recently, I had an article published in the Stepping Stone, which is the newsletter of the leadership and development section of the Society of Actuaries. Uh, this article is What is a Professional? Some answers from a Japanese TV show. And surprise, surprise, the name of the Japanese TV show is Ta-da! The Professionals. Now, this is a long-running show on NHK. Um, so it is originally produced in Japanese for the regular NHK's channel. And then for NHK World, which is the English language channel for NHK, which is to promote Japanese culture and tourism, of course, uh, to Japan. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's going to, in general, uh, give you all sorts of flavors of Japanese life and work. Um, so this is one of the programs I do like to watch. I, I do like watching Sumo just ended today. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, I wonder if there's going to be, um, uh, that they have to do a playoff. There might be a tie. Oh my gosh. Um, it's already happened by this point, but I haven't looked at any of my Sumo groups yet. Any case. Uh, so for the professionals, uh, you can go to, and I'll, I'll, drop the link uh, in the video description. Um, they have various episodes listed, and some of them you can play on demand. Usually they have at least two that you can play on demand. Um, so we have Granny Mochi, we have the uh, Take Yusuke, uh, Garbage Collector, and then Baba Ryoji, uh, Restorer of Cultural Properties. And I do mention Granny Mochi in my article. And also, actually, Amori Toru, this bus driver. But I want to talk about two other people, and they're also on this list. We have Hasegawa Hiroki, a fish broker. And uh, Ichi Kaoru, an okonomiyaki chef. And I just want to talk about them in a moment. I, if you look at the different professions listed, and so I'm an actuary. I'm a credentialed actuary, and we consider ourselves a profession. We have credentials. We have to go through a series of exams to become, and not just exams, but some other uh, requirements fulfilled as well, to become a credentialed actuary. Uh, we have continuing education requirements. Um, we have a code of ethics, code of conduct, and we have actuarial standards of practice. And I've covered some of those before, specifically ASOP 56, or newest ASOP, actuarial standard of practice. That's in the U.S., um, so standards of practice can be country-specific, or it can be international. In any case, we consider ourselves a profession. Uh, if I say a profession, what may come to mind to you is like a doctor or a lawyer. Again, you have training above and beyond and credentialing above and beyond, just going to college usually. Um, and, you know, you have the bar, you have the board. Uh, board certified for doctors, and you can lose the right to practice that profession if, I mean, it doesn't even require criminal conduct. And that's true in the actual world as well. Criminal conduct will get you booted, but um, <laughs> not necessarily automatically, and I don't want to go down that route right now. Uh, so when you see this list of professions, you're like, okay, a mochi maker, a bus driver, a labor union manager, you might not think of these as professions or professionals. Uh, one of the aspects of the program, and maybe given the kind of responses one gets, uh, I have a feeling that some of the responses weren't to this specific question, but the producers thought it fit the question well, which is what is a professional? What makes a professional? So let's talk about Hasegawa Hiroki, uh, the fish broker. And what I really liked about him is that he had a focus on basically creating value from fish that people thought were trash. When you do commercial fishing, um, and so, you know, they're showing the fishing boats and this, that, and the other. Well, you have the fishermen, but to get the fish from the fishermen to the specific restaurants and that kind of thing, often you have a middleman, a broker, okay? The fishermen don't spend their time uh, negotiating with restaurants or trying to get the best price and that kind of thing. So they'll have a catch. But the thing is, you often get fish you didn't intend 
or they have lesser value because you can only use it for, say, animal feed, that people don't want to eat it. And there are a variety of reasons people might not want to eat a fish like it doesn't taste any good. Um, so one of the aspects, and this is uh, Hiroki was trying out, is he figured out ways because the fishermen bring in the fish fresh, usually in uh, live tanks. Um, and the concept is the fresher the fish, the moment you kill the fish, it starts losing its freshness. But also the way you kill the fish can affect the taste of the meat, uh, depending on the physiological reactions to the method of killing. In any case, um, Hiroki came up with this way of killing, uh, and I don't want to get into it, mainly because I don't really know fish physiology too much. Um, and he did some experimentation and figured out first off how to get the best results from the fish that were being brought in. Uh, but one of the things he had to learn as a fish broker is how to evaluate the quality of the fish. Um, and what was interesting is over many years, he built up a reputation for the quality of fish he brought in. And the reason this is important is that the restaurants that he would work with, you know, a restaurant may say, you know, we want this amount of tuna, this amount of, and again, I don't know fish very well because I don't eat them. Um, not much. Uh, you know, this amount of salmon, and I'm making it up because I know it's not those fish. In any case, but he would come in bringing certain fish. I mean, and this is like for sushi restaurants. Um, so these need to be very fresh. A lot of this fish is not getting cooked. It's going to be served raw. Um, so it's got to be high quality. In any case, some of the restaurateurs were saying that Hiroki would sometimes bring in fish that they hadn't asked for. But because of the reputation he had built up over the years, they would accept that delivery and they would pay for the fish. So some fish that essentially would got would have gotten thrown out or just, you know, ground up in animal feed was now being served at a higher use or a higher cost, higher value purpose in restaurants. Now, one of the things to note, though, it did take many years for him to figure out some of these. He tested all of these himself. Um, and, you know, there were failures that some of the fish he just couldn't, it took a long time for him to figure out what to do with it. And, I mean, he was saying some things, and of course, this is getting translated from Japanese to English about, you know, how one man's garbage is another man's treasure and, and that kind of thing. But you have to realize a lot of failure was definitely an option. Failure is always an option. And that's something to remember with uh, many of the people profiled, and of course the people, you know, most people aren't profiled on this, that you may try to do something better, okay? And doing something better is going to be difficult because if it were easy, people would already be doing it. And you may say, well, it is easy, blah, 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 but I can't convince. Well, then the hard part is convincing people it's worth to take the time or the effort not that um, the particular technique is difficult. And that's one of the things Hiroki did because he did teach his techniques to the fishermen. Um, and he talked with the fishermen because he had to work not just with the restaurant owners, but also with the fishermen to talk about the kinds of fish they brought in and how to treat those fish in the live tanks. Or, and some of them were picking up some of his techniques themselves. So other people were influenced by what he did. And it is a small thing, okay? And most of us going out there are not changing the world in a huge way. Most of us can change the world, but in a small way. And, and it doesn't have to be through our jobs. It can be through a variety of means. However, if you want to do it through your job, there are a lot of little things. One can make things better through small changes sometimes. And that's what I often find in these profiles. Some of the stuff that people did 
just involved making relatively small changes or rather being observant about the small details that really mattered in getting their jobs done. Uh, so that's going to, that segues over to the next guy I want to talk about, Ichi Kaoru, the Okonomiyaki chef. Now, Okonomiyaki, I'm not sure if I've ever had it. I, I mean, this is kind of, it, it sounds like a Japanese street food, and I was in Japan in 1994. That was a long time ago, and I don't remember. I remember eating octopus, so, you know, I remember eating what I would call unusual things, but, like, regular stuff, like maybe okonomiyaki, I, maybe I had it, but I don't remember. So it, it seems to be, like, kind of a pile of cabbage that's kind of fried, and you put sauce on it, and there's some other stuff in there, perhaps. And it's it, it doesn't seem like a meal to me, but it, it does look like it would be a very filling snack. Um, that said, you know, it's a street food. It's savory, and it, most of the flavor would be coming from the sauce, is my understanding. However, the way this chef does it, um, that the cabbage is seen to be tastier, like a little more sweet than you usually get with cabbage. Cabbage, I think, can have a bitter edge to it and improved the taste of it. Now, this is not a high-end restaurant. Some of the people they've profiled in the past for the professionals are high-end chefs, but a lot of them are just, this is just a street food chef. And I, I don't want to diminish this as saying just, but uh, when they are picking out people to be on the professionals, again, it's not necessarily anybody who makes headlines. Uh, they are well known in their circle, and that's how, of course, the producers got to find out about them. They are known as being above and beyond other people in a similar position, so that is true, too. But when you hear the story, in the case of Kaoru, uh, the okonomiyaki chef, what he did, he had to develop his technique over years, and again, it was through experience, through experimentation, Maybe he never would have improved it, and some of it was just uh, incremental improvements. So um, he had a way to hear the sizzle, and he trains, of course, his other people to work for him. He's not the only one who works in that restaurant. That said, he, he does mention it takes him a long time to train somebody. Part of the program was a man who came in who had a dying parent, um, and he wanted to learn how to make excellent okonomiyaki for, his, I think it was his mother, um, at home, and could the chef teach him, and I can't remember how much time they had, it was a couple weeks maybe, much shorter than he usually trains. He was willing to try, but he said, you know, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able uh, to get to my level, and that's true. So that was, that's what was interesting to me, um, and most of the people they profile, of course, are older. Um, part of the reason is it takes a long time to develop that reputation, but also in these cases, it took them a long time to develop what made things better. And in the case of the fish broker, uh, it's always continuous improvement. With regards to the okonomiyaki chef, I think he decided he had found perfection. It didn't sound like he needed to tweak his technique anymore. Um, and that's true in some of these cases, like Granny Mochi. She's rather old. She's not changing how she's making mochi. Um, but she's known for her, you know, very best, very best quality mochi. Uh, any case, go check out The Professionals or my article. My article is a lot shorter than watching one of these TV programs. Um, but it's... I wouldn't call it inspiration. It's, it's an interesting perspective, and it's one that's not often shown in American TV. So something you might find interesting. See you another time.